afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for today's webinar. I'm Jen Bender with the Build Initiative, and I'm handling the logistics on today's call. Audio for today's webinar is being broadcast through your computer speakers. Please ensure your speakers are turned to a comfortable volume. If you have any questions or comments throughout the session, please type them into the chat box. Please note that other participants will not see your questions, comments in the chat box, so the presenters will monitor the chat and provide responses as they are able. This webinar is being recorded. Following the conclusion of today's webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the webinar recording, PowerPoint, and the QRIS 3.0 tools. And with that, I will turn it over to Debbie Mathias. Hi, I'm Debbie Mathias. I'm the director of the QRIS National Learning Network with the BUILD Initiative. I'm so excited to have the opportunity to share the tools and resources from BUILD with you. I think everyone on this call knows that quality rating and improvement systems are evolving rapidly. QRIS leaders are evaluating their systems to identify opportunities for improvement, try new strategies, and in some cases create new models. To contribute to the evolution of QRIS, BUILD is creating resources to address the continuing challenges of financing, QRIS design and implementation, and the need to gain adequate public investments to support QRIS sufficiently to meet its full potential of improving programs for children and families. I'm pleased to introduce and thank our speakers today. Let me move over to the next slide. Ioma Aruka is the Director of Research and Evaluation at the Buffett Early Childhood Institute at the University of Nebraska. Ann Mitchell is President of the Early Childhood Policy Research and co-founded the Alliance for Early Childhood Finance. Kate Tarrant is the Director of Research and Evaluation for the New York Early Childhood Professional Development Institute. And Harriet Dichter consults for the BUILD initiative on its systems work as well as for other national, state, and local organizations. BUILD has been fortunate to work with QRIS leaders from all around the country. We've hosted several meetings which sought to bring together people to think about QRIS and to identify big issues, big successes, and gaps, gaps that BUILD could help address. All of the tools and resources we're talking about today emerged from these think tanks, as well as the conversations I've been having with people from all over the country. I truly find, hope you'll find them helpful. Two of these papers focus on resource development and sustainability for QRIS. The paper on finance, for which I'd like to thank Ann Mitchell, Simon Workman, and Teresa Hawley, and the paper on communicating to policymakers, for which I want to thank our partner Child Trends and Harriet Dichter. The resources also include what we hope is a helpful guide for those of you planning or revising QRIS to help stay focused on the many elements that require time and attention in designing, implementing, and sustaining a QRIS effort. I offer my thanks to Ioma um, Aruka for her work on this, and Harriet and I also played a role in um, crafting this tool. At the same time, while BUILD is so proud of our work to lead a learning community, we do have some points of view about a comprehensive approach to early learning. And to that end, we believe that QRIS should meaningfully include not just childcare, but also pre-K. The paper on pre-K, which was done by Kate Tarrant, looks specifically at how states are creating integration opportunities for pre-K within their QRIS. For today's webinar, we're really just hoping to introduce you to these new resources and to whet your appetite so that you download them and, more important, use them in your day-to-day -day work on QRIS. 
Finally, I know it's time to hear from our speakers. We've organized today's webinar so that each speaker will take 10 minutes to introduce the resource. We'll then have a few follow-up questions that we prepared, but we're hoping that you'll use the chat box to pose your questions for the speakers. All of us will monitor the chat box for the questions you have. This also allows us to follow up after the webinar to address questions we couldn't quite get to during the webinar. Thank you for joining us, and to kick us off, let me turn things over to my colleague, Ioma, to discuss the tool for cross-sector QRIS. Ioma? Thank you so much, Debbie. Good morning. Good morning to some people. Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to be with you today. I am thrilled to be unveiling our tool for cross-sector QRIS. The purpose of this tool is to assist QIS designers, administrators, and implementers, and as well as select key stakeholders such as advocates and policy staff to support the development and implementation of a cross-sector QIS by focusing on school readiness, healthy child development, and equitable outcomes for young children. The purpose of this tool is to lay out multiple factors for consideration in planning, revising, and implementing a sustainable and effective QIS. A key vision of this tool is to support a cross-sector QIS, which we mean as a QIS that actively embraces and meets the needs of children in their child care and pre-K, and ideally also includes early Head Start and Head Start. This means that this QIS will address policy development, funding for raising accountability, quality improvement, and high-quality services. In essence, a high-level cross-sector QIS is one that relates to the whole early teen education system. For example, a high-level cross-sector QIS is one whose leadership is representative of the early child education sector or whose standards incorporate cross-sector programs being included to support buying effectiveness. Another key vision of this tool is to ensure equity. We broadly define equity as a QIS that assures that children with the greatest needs and limited opportunities and the programs that serve them are actively included and supported through QIS. A QIS that uses an equity lens in planning, decision making, communication, among other things, will ensure equitable outcomes. A QIS function at a high level has intentionally and explicitly incorporated and addressed issues of equity in all aspects of the system. For example, a high-level equity-based QIS is one whose leadership and partner organizations is diverse racially, ethnically, and linguistically, whose standards meet the needs of all children with particular consideration for race, language, culture, and ability, and whose improvement supports are in place for providers in disadvantaged communities, just to list a few. So with that, we just want to break things up a little bit. I will turn to a poll question. So, some of, so we, I'm going to have you read the imagery before the actual poll comes up. But so some of, but not all of you may have seen this imagery as a way to depict and visualize equity. The first image is one showing equality, where everyone benefits from the same support. The second is where individuals are given different support. And the third is where the inequity was addressed. And the systematic barrier, in this case the fence, has been removed. So I want you to read this imagery and then identify and define which one is your current system. So go ahead and read it for a couple of seconds, and then we'll turn to the actual poll. I appreciate everybody logging in their responses quickly. We'll give it a little bit of time.
Okay, we'll give people maybe about 10 more seconds. And then I'll have, we can move to the next next poll. So as you can see, just from the poll that's coming in, people are doing the different support um, with about a quarter, a little bit more than a quarter, giving the same support, so more about the equality or universal approach. And the majority is trying to differentiate. And at least two people say no supports are needed. Cause so we can talk more about this, um, but I'll first keep continue with the webinar. But keep logging in your poll. So the second poll that I want people to um, answer is, who are the partners in your current system? Child care only, child care and pre-K, child care and early, early Head Start, Head Start, child care pre-K and the Head Start community, or you just don't know. Well, it looks like the majority right now is saying it's really child care, pre-K, early head start. So, the, so a good chunk of the early in education community. So I'll give about 10 more seconds, and then we'll close that up. Okay. So here we see the majority of saying, as we can see here, child care, pre-K, early head start is the majority, and then with some at the child care only or child care and pre-K. So again, more for discussion. Some just don't know about 10%, so we'll just continue. So now to give you a very brief high-level review of what is in this tool that uh, we're talking about. There are eight sections to the tool. Mission vision is number one, leadership and governance, financing, stakeholder engagement, standards, QRS accountability and rating, improvement support, and then summary charts. Again, I'm just giving you at the high level um, in more details later. And this tool, I should say, is an Excel format to provide for more flexibility. So for those who will be part of the text group, we'll look forward to getting your feedback, as well as others who may also use it ad hoc. So to just give you a sampling, so within each section, so we have finance, and we have eight, seven different sections, and then the summary chart is the eighth section. Within each section is a subsection for a total of 32 subsections. And so, for example, under section three, financing, we have five subsections. Within each subsection, there's also a drop-down box that the QIS administrative team can use to note the current status of their system with the option of high, moderate, and basic. There's also an area for notes, evidence, and comments about why the team gave that particular rating, as well as a column for next steps and resource, which you can see here. Note that there's also a worksheet for resources for each of the sections. So for any of the seven sections, with the exception of the summary sheet, there's a resource that people can click on to get more details and understanding about that section. One of the particularly exciting part about the summary sheet is that it can be used group or individually. It can set up to populate. It can be based on group consensus, and you can tell whether you're high, moderate, or basic. It also provides a column that really provides an added glance sort of process. So here's an example of how the sheet would look. So it has where, if you look under um, the logic model section 1, D, the theory of change logic model, you can see we selected moderate. And you can see in the summary sheet where it has populated moderate with the X. And it will populate automatically, which is why we use the Excel version. So similarly with the, with the summary sheet, you're allowed to do group, so you can mark under the group section where it populates. You can also do the individual section. And it also allows you to prioritize areas of focus. It also has a section for notes as well as next steps. So really the summary sheet provides your added glance that you can use as a group to communicate with each other internally, but could also potentially be used for outside stakeholders as well. There's so much more to share about this first of its kind tool. However, I will now turn it over to my colleagues and Mitchell. Ann, I see you come next. It is. I just had myself on mute. Sorry. <laughs> Good afternoon. It's Ann Mitchell. Um, 
I'm very excited to be presenting this finance paper finally. I want to first thank my colleagues, Teresa Hawley, who is now with Illinois Action for Children, and Simon Workman, who is with the Center for American Progress. I want to thank them for being excellent thinkers and writers and partners in this process. So I'm presenting today, but we all wrote the paper, and we really hope you enjoy it. We start out with a very firm belief that QIS is the means to deliver adequate funding to all types of early care and education programs based on the quality of the services they are providing. And that's the key. Um, some considerations in that, or you might think of them as challenges, is that high quality early care and education costs a lot more than low quality. And most families can't afford high quality. But QRIS is a strategy for differentiating financial support based on quality and also helping families of different income levels to afford high quality care. So QRIS is a really important invention and we have to uh, fund it adequately to make it work right. Um, there's a set of facts about who's paying for early care and education now that are important to start with as a base. I thought about making this a poll question and saying what percentage of of all the funding for early care and education in the United States comes from families. Well, it turns out families are the, the majority funder at 52%. And next is the government. And government means all levels, federal, state, and local, to the best that we can um, estimate and find data sources for all of them. Um, and the private sector is actually quite small. And that includes everything private, philanthropy, United Way, employers who pay for childcare for their own employees all of that. So, so what's the problem? We have this conundrum in our field between cost and quality. Higher quality costs more than most families can afford. And our early care and education marketplace is split between programs that are free, like pre-K and Head Start and special ed, and programs for which families pay tuition, child care and nursery schools, programs like that. The majority of our system at this point is in that tuition-based category. And tuition-based early care and education encourages price competition because families don't have a lot of money, suppliers keep their tuition fees low, which discourages them from being able to invest in quality. QRIS is a means to invest in quality, but most QRIS have been very limited in their impact on the entire market because we're not paying enough attention to the necessary investment in the cost of services. We have not put a lot of, of effort into paying for higher quality services. We'll talk a little bit about how that, that happens. But the two high quality cost factors, the ones that really make a difference, are both related to personnel, and that should be no surprise to anyone who's ever uh, looked at the finances of an early childhood program. Ratios and group sizes that are low enough to support children's individualized learning. Ratios and group sizes that are good for children. And compensation that's high enough so you attract and retain good teachers and create jobs that are, are able to reduce the stresses that poverty and near poverty wages can create. We want a well-qualified, well-compensated, happy workforce. When we look at how, to thinking about financing a QRS, we have to think about all the parts of it. And we've had several different ways of talking about the parts of a QRS over the period of time that we've been inventing them. And the way that we approach it in, in thinking about financing is say, the rating process and the accountability of a QRIS system is one set of things that need to be funded. All the quality improvement supports professional development, quality improvement that might be in the form of coaches or mentors or other kinds of, of supports, and the direct services of early care and education that are provided by the programs that participate and need to re receive differential funding in relationship to their quality. And by far, it's the direct services that are the most expensive part of a QRIS, and they're also the least attended to in, in our QRIS finance um, 
currently. But funding quality services is the key to success, and we need to do more of it and, and be um, smarter and more adventurous about how we do it. Um, the rating process and system accountability means the things that Hioma was talking about in terms of rating, communication, management, evaluation. And I would say that these are, are often more adequately funded, somewhat adequately funded in a QRIS, or the QRIS couldn't function at all. Now, I have a little poll question. So in current QRIS, you can think of it uh, as your state or, or overall, what do you think the proportion among the elements of QRIS is? And you've got three choices here, so make your choices, and then we'll, we'll see what people think. Somehow I can't tell whether lots of people are making answers or not. Should I skip to the results? Yes, Anne, skip yeah. the results. Okay. <laughs> All right. So the majority of you think it's 20% for rating and 80% for everything else. Well, you're kind of split. All right, the, the real answer is, and, and about more than a third of you got it, 40% um, for rating and 60% for everything else. Now, in this next slide, I want to show you something that really, if we were going to have a financially balanced QRIS, that we were investing appropriately in the parts of it, all, all of the quality um, assessment, monitoring, communication, all of the system parts are these tiny little slices up at the top, communication, evaluation, data systems, technical assistance, and those amount to about 5%. And 95% of the funding is spent on quality improvement supports, financial support to programs, and compensation support. So if, if our financing in QRIS looked like that, 5% for the system rating process and administration and 95% for supporting the quality of programs, we'd be in great shape. Now we've got, we've got to get more money into these QRIS systems in order to be able to fund the direct services. So we looked at um, the current sources of QRIS funding and using data from the QRIS compendium. Unfortunately, only 15 of the 40 QRIS that provided information provided financial information. And when we look at that, those 11 of the 15 say the Child Care and Development Block Grant funds were their main source or their sole funding source. And the other sources that were noted, state general funds, the Race to the Top Early Learning Challenge, state pre-K funds, licensing fees, and the QRIS that are local reported sources from local government. Now, there are other potential sources that exist right now and could be used in a QRIS, and perhaps some are, but that was not reported in the compendium. The Every Student Succeeds Act, the uh, successor to um, a No Child Left Behind. Uh, Workforce Investment Opportunity Act. There's higher education funding at federal and state levels in terms of scholarships and tax credits that could be used to support some of the parts of the QRIS, particularly having to do with um, professionals. So I, I just want to say, those of you who are the managers of a QRIS, please, please, please um, put complete data into the compendium next time you update your 
your state's um, or locality's records, because having better information about how we're financing it now would be really useful. So in, in order to, to really robustly fund a QRIS, we're going to have to expand our current sources pretty dramatically, and we're going to have to make sure that all of them are connected to our QRIS. So to fully fund a QRIS, we're going to have to increase the overall investment in the Child Care and Development Fund, since that is the, the source that almost all states are using now. Not just higher rates, not just higher subsidy rates, tiered reimbursement, but funding, dramatically increasing the amount of funding in the program so that it reaches more than the currently 17 percent of eligible families. We need to fully fund Head Start, fully fund early Head Start, get universal pre-K in every state, and it needs to be, for all preschoolers, diverse delivery and with sufficient funding so that it can support compensation parity between community-based and public school programs, between those tuition-based and free programs. And we could really do a lot with refundable tax credits. Most, if every jurisdiction that taxes income had refundable tax credits that were indexed for inflation, covered a significant share of families' costs, linked those benefits to quality, which very few QRS do now, and were refundable, which makes them useful for lower-income taxpayers, we'd be in better shape. We need multiple sources of funding. We will never do this only on one. And I, Kate is going to talk next about how to put pre-K in your QRIS. But one, one last plea. I want us to fully finance a QRIS, and it's going to require a lot more public revenue. I think families are paying as much as they can. We might be able to increase that some, but not a lot. And obviously the private sector is small. So we have to get really good at understanding how to expand and create new revenue-generating mechanisms. So I want everyone to expand your revenue-generating portfolio. First, it's got to be linked to QRIS. Right now there are local property taxes in Seattle and San Francisco that support uh, early care and education services and link to the state's QRIS. There's a sales tax, Philadelphia um, beverage distribution tax, is paying for preschool and it's connected to Pennsylvania's QRIS. The city of Dayton, Ohio, just voted in a local income tax increase to pay for preschool. There are state income tax credits that every state should be doing. Uh, Louisiana and Nebraska school readiness tax credits are linked to their QRS and they support compensation increases. None of the revenue sources we have or any of the new ones we invent are going to alone be able to fill the gap. We've got to put local, state, and federal together with family contributions, and then we'll be able to fully fund quality. So I want all of us to become more conscious of how to raise revenue and get serious about how much we need. So your QRIS is the way to ensure that quality is what we're paying for, no matter what the funding source is. So let me stop there and turn it over to Kate Tarrant. Thank you so much, Anne. Um, I just want to start by saying what an honor it is to be part of this discussion with all of you, um, and to also thank Harriet for her work in really um, moving us all together and getting us to this point. Um, and I'm happy to be kind of jumping off of the conversation that Anne um, started um, and Ioma started. Debbie asked me to write this paper because in her work with all of you, um, she has been hearing about the challenge um, and opportunity of building a QRES that really works with um, state funded, state and locally funded pre-K in a meaningful way. Um, and so the purpose of this particular paper was to support policymakers and advocates examine their existing approaches as they strive to increase the coherence, effectiveness, and equity of their early care and education systems. And so to do this work, I relied heavily on the Child Trends, uh, the, sorry, the QRS Compendium, so I wanted to give some props to the team at Child Trends for pulling that all together for us, um, and also the Near State Preschool Yearbook which provides actually some really good information within the notes about each state about um, 
you know, the ways that their pre-K systems and programs are designed. I also relied on some of the resources coming out of the federal TA centers, past presentations at the QRIS NLN meeting, and had several conversations with folks who are on the ground doing this work. Um, so I owe a debt of gratitude to all of you for um, helping me along with this project. And um, as we all know, um, the early care and education system is really fledgling and we need coherence. And by coherence, we're talking about um, a mindset in which any new investment within this system really builds in a thoughtful way on what is already in place. And clearly, with the growth of QRIS and pre-K across our nation, um, coherence is especially critical. And so um, we need to think a lot about whether these approaches are working in concert or at cross purposes. And um, you know, both QRES and Pre-K share a goal of expanding access to quality. So it seems like a no-brainer, like of course they should work together, <laughs> same goal. But of course, as you all know, um, they really take um, on this challenge in different ways um, that has pretty significant implications for um, whether or not and how these different approaches are integrated. And um, we have the wonderful um, privilege of 50 states, which, are, which means we've got 50 different QRESs and 50 different pre-K programs that have to kind of figure this out, and often many, many more because you know, you've got states that have multiple pre-K programs, um, like my home state, New York. Um, the different context of you know, um, pre-K or the context for pre-K is that it's rooted in the education um, sector, it's a targeted intervention, and that the way it's funded is um, ideally to cover the program um, standards. QRES is the framework that's layered, um, started kind of layered on top of that child care system um, that really uses the ECE market. So these are pretty substantial differences that have to be overcome in terms of building a coherent approach. So with this paper, um, we really kind of, it has basically two parts. The first part is um, a side-by-side -side comparison of how these two approaches to expand quality look along seven dimensions. And we looked at governance and funding, which really drives so much of the design of um, pre-K and QRES. And then the five features that we commonly talk about associated with QRES. Now this side-by-side -side comparison that we provide in the paper makes generalizations about um, QRES and pre-K based on what I was able to review in the near yearbook and the QRES compendium. But um, we do see this as being a tool that you could, a framework that you could use within your state looking specifically at the policy documents that you have for your QRIS and your um, pre-K uh, program. And I also do want to note that um, we talk a lot about state-funded pre-K, but the local funded um, initiatives that, you know, like Anne was just referring to, um, play a really big role here too. And so these kind of, the side-by-side -side comparison can happen at the local level as well. Each one of these dimensions could be a paper unto itself and could be a session at the QRI, QRI uh, um, S NLN meeting um, and deserve a lot of attention. The next part of the paper was to um, look at what states are doing in light of um, kind of two key questions. And one had to do with pre-K participation policies and whether a state pre-K was encouraging or mandating pre-K programs to be rated. And then the next piece had to do with the QRIS structure. So what extent, to what extent are the components inclusive of pre-K? Um, and it's our, it was our stance, and as Debbie mentioned um, at the beginning of the call, we took the stance that the more integrated and unified the approach, the more likely the um, overall ECE system would be able to provide equitable access to quality care. 
The first model is where there really isn't any integration at all. Um, that's where the QRIS is really designed for the child care program, um, or there isn't a statewide pre-K at this point in time. Um, there aren't many of these instances, but they do still exist. For each approach, we did highlight some strengths and challenges. And um, when you look at the paper, you can um, see kind of what some of those specific strengths and challenges are. Um, and these states are really poised, I think, to use the, the tools that we've developed to create a, a cohesive QRIS um, approach. The second model is the cross-sector, um, is when cross-sector participation is allowed and even encouraged. And we talk about Georgia in the paper as an example of this. Um, and this has the advantage of being flexible. Um, programs that have the capacity can really take up the um, opportunities avail available. Um, but there are challenges in terms of uh, redundancies and um, making sure that uh, what are notions of what quality means within the state. The next model is the alternative pathway model, which we're seeing more and more of. Um, in the paper, we talk about Delaware. Um, Minnesota when, uh, has an alternative pathway, and their validation report showed some really interesting results on that um, that I think are exciting. Um, this is the approach when a program that meets the pre-K standards is automatically, automatically enters the QRIS that it does in, at a certain generally high level, maybe the highest level. Um, that same kind of alternative pathway is often provided for Head Start programs that meet their standards and NACI accredited programs. Um, it has the advantage of being really, um, of honoring the different contexts and different policy guidance um, that informs uh, programs. Um, it does have some challenges, um, however, and um, when programs co-locate pre-K and child care, they may have to kind of navigate two different notions of what quality means. Um, and then for the pre-K programs to really benefit, um, you know, pre-K with a mixed delivery especially, um, the incentives and the supports have to be really meaningful for those pre-K programs to um, value the QRES. The next model is, the, um, is a unified framework, that, one in which the QRES is really designed to be inclusive from the get-go across multiple of those seven dimensions to be inclusive of pre-K. We highlight Ohio as an example here, who really just recently um, reformed their whole QRES um, and the um, uh, leaders of the agencies responsible for child care and pre-K worked um, arm in arm as they were designing um, the, the system. And we see this as being an approach that leverages resources um, in a way that um, we think can really get us closer to our goal of having an equitable, accessible, high quality early care and education system. So we're curious um, to hear what you think about your current system. And so this next poll question asks, you about how you would classify your system. Um, and I did want to say that we toyed with the idea of putting together a table and classifying each state um, according to the, some, the criteria we had developed, but quickly realized with the ever-changing nature of QRIS and state-funded pre-K programs and the local options that were evolving um, that really um, you know, that it wouldn't make sense for us to nail down um, each state in its approach and, and put them all in one model and in distinct models. So I'm very curious to see kind of how you see your state system um, in answering this question. I also do um, suspect that there are some, some of you all out there who say, I could be this or it could be that. Um, so um, it's a complex classification, I would say. Um, and there might be some elements in some, some of those seven dimensions um, we refer to where you feel like it's really unified um, and cohesive and others where, where you don't see that happening.
All right. So um, there are a lot of the alternative pathways. It's, it's an interesting split. I'm going to, um, I know we know we don't have a representative, this can't be um, representative, but um, I think it's an, an interesting point of information um, to consider as we move forward and as you all move forward in revising and reforming your systems. Our paper concludes with some strategies that can support progress towards moving to a cross-sector approach. And they have to do with governance and funding using consistent standards across different program types, not necessarily the exact same. Um, the move to the few and powerful I think is really relevant when it comes to standards for programs and practitioners. Um, aligning supports can be a really important opportunity for our systems. Um, I think we all know of Sites that take up multiple initiatives sometimes have four or five TA providers. Um, there's a real opportunity to maximize resources and find efficiencies when we are more cohesive in the supports provided to programs. Um, and then there are opportunities around coordinated, mo coordinated um, monitoring. And then the last strategy has to do with evaluation. We need to learn about what's really working well um, and know that there are going to be different answers for different places. Um, and I would just put a plug for equity as being an outcome of um, focus when um, folks do undertake evaluation efforts. So thank you all, and I'm going to turn it over to Harriet. Thank you, Kate. Hi, everyone. I really appreciate being here. And as I think Debbie said at the outset of um, our presentations today, uh, Bill teamed up with Child Trends to focus on this topic. Um, and this guide is really to help people think about communication strategies that are specific to reaching public policy audiences. And by public policy audiences, we mean people who make decisions like governors, legislators, basically people who are deciding at a high level whether to invest and how much to invest in your QRIS. So I think we all know how important communications are to everything that we do. But the focus here, again, is on communicating with policymakers because of the need to really resource our QRIS. And policymakers are a pretty critical decision maker. The way that we set up the guide itself, we have outlined these elements that you can see on the slide of the communications process. And we've really defined a set of six steps and I'm going to, at a really high level, just introduce you to them. Our hope is that you will travel to the BUILD website and um, actually open the guide yourself and take a deeper look at it. But we start with examining uh, context and setting objectives. This is the piece that I think you all know well, that every state or locality is its own context. So that has to be assessed and the objectives that you have for this work are really particular to your own context and state. Second, identifying target audiences. Third, developing messages. Fourth, finding the right messengers. Fifth, focusing on outreach and execution. And um, last year, collecting, analyzing, and applying data as part of your communication strategies. So the guide runs through a number of factors to look at in the context of your own state or local community that will also help you identify your key objectives for the QRES communications work that you're doing with policymakers. And we cover topics like policy goals and context timing and resources. The very first phase of this work is really critical as it sets forth the purpose of the work and helps you identify what you're trying to achieve. So I've posted just one example here that we use to help think about framing, and that really is where are your public policymakers and where are you trying to get to with them? And in this example, the red arrow basically talks about are, are you in a place where your goal is to raise awareness? 
What is a QRIS? Why is it important? Are you in a place where you're really trying to increase salience? Why should your QRIS be a higher policy priority? How can you connect it to a higher policy priority for your decision makers? And third, maybe you're at a place around taking action, how policymakers can improve and expand the QRIS. Now, I didn't list here, which I think you probably all know intuitively, that your own goal might turn out to be defensive, but we chose to put you know, very proactive ones up here for this conversation. Identifying audiences, of course, are pretty important. And so we really need to be specific about what, who those audiences are and have a strategy that is specific to the audiences that you're trying to reach. Here are some ways to really think about as you're thinking about policymaker audiences and some possible ways that they can be categorized for your uh, communication strategy. So policymakers who actually don't know what a QRIS is and they don't know how it relates to things that they care about, not things you care about, things that they care about. Policymakers, again, who know about that QRIS but they need support one way or another to get it to be in a place where they want to act upon it for you. And then, of course, those policymakers who are primed, they're ready to act. They just need a plan. And finally, naysayers who you may evaluate and decide that you need to move from opposed to neutral. As you identify audiences, values are pretty critical. It's essential in doing this type of work that you relate to your audience interests, your audience values, and your audience engagement in the endpoint that you have in mind. Now, another key part of the process that you saw in the first slide is really around developing messages. And in the realm of communication strategies to promote QRIS policy, this means having something to say that a legislator or executive branch decision maker wants to know or cares about and that she or he might act upon. At the same time, credible messengers are a critical component of being able to convey information effectively, and I'll address that a little bit later. In developing messages, one of the things that you'll see when you take a look at this document is that we conducted a set of interviews with policymakers, administrators, and advocates all over the country. And we actually learned a lot from these interviews, the types of messages people are conveying to their policymakers, how policymakers perceive the messages that they're getting, and then um, what policymakers consider to be a public policy justification for the QRIS. So time does not permit us to review these, um, but I hope you will look into the document and be able to see a little bit more what people told us. At the same time that I'm saying that, while we did and we're very careful to have a geographically balanced sample, and we did talk to people from Democrats and Republicans alike, it was a sample. So we do want to caution you basically about overgeneralizing but we have several pages of charts uh, in the document so that you can see as a general matter what advocates and administrators were saying and as a general matter what policymakers are understanding on the messaging side for the QRIS. Also in here, because this issue of developing messages is so critical, in this section of the guide, we really focus on the use of the message box, and we provide several samples. The whole point of using the message box is really to help you simplify and get to the most essential elements, and it creates some of that discipline around staying on message and kind of evaluating um, how your messaging is working. I mentioned before that finding the right messenger is pretty critical because who's saying this, the work for you, is as important as what is being said. And so in this section of our guide, we address the issue of spokespeople, 
preparation of your spokespeople, relationships, and even venues that really help the messenger to deliver effectively and to really be an important part of the case. We have another section in here that's devoted to outreach and execution. And here, basically, we're addressing issues such as context, media, materials, as well as timing, policymaker calendar issues, overall election cycles, and things such as that. Those are things that are pretty important to think about. And I think our overall point here is as you're doing work on your communication strategy that you really have to think about it as a campaign um, and be disciplined about it in the same way that people are disciplined about campaigns. Finally, we have a section that really is around data. And I want to emphasize here that we do see the use of data as part of the communications process. And we really talk about this in two ways. First is whatever data you do have about the QRIS. I think that probably everyone on the call knows that it becomes important as messages are shaped, that some messages have an emotionally compelling narrative, and some messages are really coming from smart use of your data. But there's more to it than this, which is actually collecting and analyzing data about what you're doing in the communications process to try to help you to understand how to improve that process itself. One of the notes we have in here is that sometimes this part of the work doesn't really get attached to anyone and they don't, aren't accountable for this part. And I think we are trying to make the case in this section of the guide that you actually really need someone who's attending to the tracking and the organizing around this aspect of your communication strategy. So finally, I think in um, leading us on to the next part of our uh, webinar today, um, we really want to stress that as people are thinking about and working on communications, that intentionality is pretty critical. Uh, as we think about the powerful presentation from Anne, where she showed us basically some of the big issues around the financing and gave us pretty compelling information about the fact that we have to find a way to increase the public investment. The communications work with policymakers is definitely part on that. So we're hoping that the guide itself really will help people uh, who are newer to this work get more proactive and become as strategic as possible so that you can effectively position your own QRIS within your state or local policy context and um, be as successful as possible in moving forward a smart public policy agenda on communications for the QRIS. I'm going to turn things over to Debbie Down. Thank you, everyone. Hi, I'm back. <laughs> um, we had a couple of angles. We were thinking about how state uh, leaders might be able to use the tools and about how advocacy or stakeholders within the community might be able to use the tools. So I'm going to ask our um, speakers to talk to about their tool. And let's begin with how can state leaders use this tool or the information that you've provided in the documents? And then we're going to move quickly after we consider those two scenarios to some of the questions that we've seen uh, in the chat box. And at this point, uh, we have a little while yet to go. So if you have something that you want us to um, answer or address, please make sure to get it into the chat box. We do have a number of questions already to go back to. So before we go to the questions in the chat box, um, could I ask Ann um, to discuss how state leaders might be able to use the tool that um, and the resources that uh, she's created here for us. Sure. Um, it seems to me that one of, the, one of the ways to use the tool is to read this paper and, and sort of absorb the approach that it's taking to say QRIS can be for all children, all programs. It's a way for state leaders to understand how to make your QRIS most efficient 
with the resources you've got, you can rebalance your current funding to invest in services based on quality. And I think that's, that's an, an important piece of it. And it also lays out, and more in the paper than we were able to do in, in a, um, 10 minutes in a webinar, um, new revenue generating mechanisms and see how they fit with others. So I know one of the questions in the chat box was, well, why are you just talking about pre-K? Do you mean QRIS is only for preschoolers? No, but we go where the wind blows, and, and the uh, public interest and, and appetite to fund preschool is pretty high. So let's use it and make sure it's connected to pre-K. And QRIS is and in the pre-K. That's why that whole paper was put together. And I think you were really wise when you were showing the pie in because you have a pie of funding and we've either got to get more funding in there or look at how we're allocating the funding that we have available. And we had a few questions, and if you don't mind um, right now, uh, in terms of um, did the annual financial support like to providers assume that the provider base rates were 75% of the market? I, I don't think you were assuming that, but could you address that question? Sure. Um, yes, there are a number of questions that um, I need to address. So is it at 75% of the market? Well, there's a flaw in even thinking about 75% of the market. I know that's a metric that's used, but the problem is that market rates are are depressed by the fact that they are what families can afford. They're not what high quality actually costs. So mm. the the way in which we we used rates in developing uh, estimates for the cost of a QRS was rates at different levels for different levels of quality. So they might be mm. higher 75% of the market rate. Mm. Um, mm -hmm. Someone asked about what's the financial balance slide based on. It's based on uh, putting fairly generous uh, quality improvement and compensation supports and direct payments to programs into a tool that, that develops a cost estimate for a QRIS and then just presenting that as a, as a um, pie chart. Mm -hmm. And I think there's mm -hmm. another question. Uh, should QRS incentives vary based on the funding resources available to the program? Yes, absolutely. Those that have fewer resources should get more money. I think those are all the ones that I see that are related to funding that are in the chat box. But yeah, that's great. Thank you so you know. much, Anne. Great. And, and now let's move to EOMA. If you were thinking about how state leaders might use uh, the tool, uh, what, what would you say about that? Yes, thanks, Debbie. So I should say and emphasize again that this is sort of the first tool of its kind for the QIS, and so it's clearly in its first iteration, so we hope to obviously improve it. But really the, the whole idea, you know, and obviously with the help of Debbie and Harriet, is to really have a tool that really supports continuous quality improvement, right? That is what makes QIS what it is, is this idea that there's a feedback loop. And so the tool is really embracing that, that notion. And also, because we have both the tool itself, but also the summary part that really tries to present where um, a particular QIS is at a glance, that it really should help with communicating right, with each other internally for the QIS system, as well as to prioritize your actions. And so not only is it about, let me just look at one aspect, of, let me just look at finances, for example, or let me just look at the leadership, but the tool is trying to help you really think about how do you think about it together and integrate it, right? So if you're going to think about leadership, how do you think about finances, how do you think about standards? So that's, so that's part of what it's trying to do is help, help you to communicate internally and really to, to, to integrate all aspects of your QIS. And then most importantly is to ensure that the system matches the vision, right? So a lot of people have a vision of the, just our QIS is going to address the achievement gap. And so as one of the examples, but then all the subsequent pieces, whether it's the standards, accountability, finance, and leadership, does not actually lead towards that. So how do we make sure that the system that we envision actually matches? And this tool is supposed to help really elevate that um, discourse and that inquiry and continuous quality improvement. 
And then I would say the other piece that it does is also really try to, as much as possible, address this issue of equity. Um, a lot of people collect that equity as sort of the, the the way their system is, but really the tool tries to really help you figure out is that really the case? Are you just looking at equity from just one one point in time and just focus on one area, or are you looking at equity throughout the whole entire system? So that's just some of the pieces of what um, how states can really use the tool. Ioma. <clears throat> Can you clarify for me? We have a question in the chat box, and the the tool incorporates whatever um, services or age groups are found within the state. So, if the state is offering QRIS and school ages involved, the two tool would be relevant for for that that state, and and would account for school age as well. Am I correct in saying exactly. that? Yeah, so the tool is, I think, is very flexible in that. It, it, so I know you probably haven't all looked at it, but it really provides that flexibility. So whatever your system is, all the tool is trying to provide you with sort of the, the how to look at certain things, right? So how does your finance and match your theory of change? How does your finance and match your standards? Like, so the tool is supposed to be flexible enough and broad enough that it can incorporate wherever you are, whether you're only a child care, for example, you're trying to move towards a pre, including pre-K um, and early Head Start. So it's trying to meet you where you are at and then sort of help you sort of march towards that higher level. And it, so it's exactly to that question of, how, you know, addressing school age, it should be able to do that. If that's part of the vision of your system, then the tool will help you at least think about all the pieces to fit into that, whether around standards, around improvement support, accountability, et cetera. So at least help you think about that in a much broader frame than just, you know, individuals. And of course, we want feedback from everyone out there as they use that tool and yeah. write us a note and uh, provide uh, that uh, yeah. from the experience, so we're really looking forward to hearing from people as they dig into it and start working with it. Um, all right, well, let me go to the next slide here. And we have pre-K. Kate, could you talk a little bit about how state leaders might be able to use the paper and, and their thinking about cross-sector QRIS? Sure, Debbie. Um, so we really see this um, if I see this really as a conversation starter um, and a way for policymakers um, kind of at each level of the system um, perhaps to, to engage on this really complex topic of how these two approaches intersect. And we saw some comments in the chat box related to some of the nitty-gritty around certifications and compensation. Um, and, you know, each state I think is really wrestling with um, you know specific program and policy application um, of the the state pre-K and the QRIS. So this is a jumping off point for I think a lot of those conversations, and um, we also put in the paper um, some discussion questions associated with each recommended strategy um, to help. Uh, folks who want to engage more deeply and to, thinking about how well their their approaches are working together, um, ask you know think about some of the the hard issues. So um, I think it's good context, and I think it's really a good conversation starter. And um, we also want it to be used to think when about how um, when you're talking about pre-K and QRES, how important it is to think across. Um, all of those seven dimensions, governance, funding for the system and services, as well as all those uh, kind of key QRS components. And Kate, I just wanted to clarify, when we're talking about a pre-K program, we're uh -huh. not talking about the pre-K classroom and a child care program. We're talking exactly. about children that are funded through a dedicated pre-K funding stream. Correct. Exactly. The, the the major funding stream that, um, and you know, as you, in most states, it's um, that relies on a mixed delivery system. Um, and we do know, we you know, also have heard that it's a, a specific challenge to engage the public and when you've got a mixed delivery system, um, in which the public school delivers a lot of the pre-K. It presents some really unique challenges to get um, kind of the buy-in, and I think um, Harriet's paper will really help when it comes to that piece. Um, 
but we hope that this paper will, will be a way to engage all of the stakeholders who have authority um, to uh, ask the hard questions and find better solutions around um, creating a coherent approach. Well, thank you, Kate, for the segue over to uh, Harriet to tell us a little bit about how the communications primer would be used or could help state leaders. Okay, thank you, Debbie. So in thinking about how um, state staff, people working in the public sector or their partners really focusing on design or implementation issues might be able to use this, the first was actually to sort of step back and be reminded that words matter. And so however you're characterizing the QRES, you're messaging about it. And so this really to ask people and say, let's be intentional and let's be strategic about policymaker communications, the briefing to an agency head, the briefing to a policy person, those are part of the communications process. The second is actually to try to think about communications at this level. I know we often think about communications in terms of outreach to parents or outreach to providers to get them excited about the QIS, to hear from them, really engage them. But to really think about the communications processes with decision makers who ultimately exercise a great deal of control on the investment strategy that you have, and to actually put that on the same par that people devote to all of the work that goes into program development and all of the work that goes into program oversight and implementation. Thank you, Harriet. And now we're all we're going to shift the view just a little bit and think about. Is there a difference or is there something unique about how advocates or stakeholders might use the tool? And if we could circle right back to EOMA to help us think a little bit about the tool in terms of stakeholder engagement for advocates. Yes. So I mean I I mean I think similar to sort of how states can use it. Obviously when we say continuous quality improvement, we're talking about sort of we need to also help advocates begin to think about continuous quality improvement as part of early education, particularly around QIS. So they understand part of QIS is not a static sort of system, that one that's always trying to do better for its, the system and the children and families and communities to serve. So the idea is that the tool, especially the summit, can really be a, a, a sort of a tool to kind of communicate with external uh, stakeholders, aka advocates. And so that will be what we hope that the tool can be used for. Um, it also can help to communicate and prioritize action, right? So if you can communicate to your, to your advocates, here are areas of focus. Here's the reason why. Here are the areas that in the future we're going to move towards. So they have a sense of this is our priority right now, but however, we have future priorities that are going to eventually fold into the larger vision of our system. And then, again, it also sort of addresses the issue of it ensures that the advocates understand that the tool is going to help us begin to match our words with our finances and everything else that goes into it. So I would say that the similar usage of the tool for states is something similar with advocates, but with a different thing to really hone in more on that communication and for them to understand where that current system is and where it's trying to go. Thank you. Thank you. Anne, what's your take? on the finance paper in terms of advocates and stakeholders? Well, it seems to me that the finance paper is a way, if, if you can get advocates and stakeholders to read the whole thing, and I realize it's long, um, it's a way to understand the early care and education market better so that you, they can get a fuller picture of it. Because I think a lot of times we um, get into so much detail about each different part of it that it becomes overwhelming um, for people to understand what the whole thing is. And we're really trying to improve the whole thing. And we want to improve all of it using QRIS as the accountability measure. So we've got one market, it's got a lot of parts, and we have QRIS, which is perfectly capable of being the accountability measure for increased investment for any kind of program in our market. And that's, I think, how I would want advocates and stakeholders to use this. 
Mm-hmm. And you know, we had a question a... in the chat box that I want to answer. I particularly I like it. Go for okay. it because I'm states... looking. <laughs> are any states that have legalized marijuana using a percentage of this revenue stream to fund their state QRS? Is this a viable option? Well, uh, no, I don't believe there are any. I believe that in Humboldt County, California, they are doing a tax that's related to marijuana, if I understand it right. But it is broadly for social services, so ECE would have to would have to argue for its share of that money. Um, I think any we're going to need a lot of funding sources to make this work. It's never going to be just one, so we got to try them all. But there are considerations about uh, is it a are we taxing something that the use of is going to go down over time, which is true of smoking and and uh, alcohol, tobacco taxes that. We want people to stop smoking, so basing revenue on it is going to decline over time. And so you'd like to do something like tax income because that increases over time. And I don't think there's you any know, other questions that are finance related in there. But You know, I think that that question really also steps over into communication. So let's, mm -hmm. because one of the points, and we'll give Harry the shot at this question as well, you know, one of the points is how are you setting the table when those kind of opportunities to come up so that you're there ready to you know, maximize that. But um, let's move to the next slide here. And why don't we go with communications first just because of that question. And Harriet, what, what would be your thinking about getting staged up and ready for that or how the communications primer might help you with an opportunity like that? Yeah, I mean, I think here there are maybe two parts of this. So one is the piece that we've been saying, you have to be organized and you have to be proactive in order to become a part of creating, right, or maximizing a new revenue opportunity. You can't really be too late to that table. You have to be in on the ground floor and what you're doing has to be seen as a sufficiently important priority to get that to be included. So I, I think my main thing is I know with, um, whoever raised the question about uh, the marijuana thing, I know I've heard that from other people. People say, oh, how can we get in on that or wouldn't it be great? People are debating those measures that we could get that added. But I think that as you really think about the challenges for that, um, you've got to be in there before it's so much in the public conversation that your issue has to get attached to it. Um, and I think we've actually seen, well, I live in Philadelphia, so we have the soda tax, and it's interesting because that campaign was not waged on the public health benefits of having the soda tax. That campaign was really waged on the community benefit of really doing better for children through the pre-K program and for the community as a whole through additional investment from that tax in community parks and recreation. And so that's a nice example that you don't have to have a direct connection to you know, what the revenue is being raised from and what the revenue might be able to be used for. So I mean, I think my main piece here is that um, the work on communications is actually should be an integral ongoing part of the work. And that's especially critical for people outside government, basically, to be doing that organizing. But there is also a critical role, sometimes depending on the nature of how the inside government part is organized. But to be part of that, just again, in the way that people are shaping and discussing what the purpose of the QRIS is, thinking about how those purposes relate to the overall values that people see as uh, important use of public money in the state. Thank you, Harriet. Okay, Kate, what would you think about the information you brought forward in the paper in terms of advocates and stakeholders? You know, I, I, my answer here isn't so different from the answer for the policymakers. It's a tool to launch the conversation that has to happen, I think, both 
um, internally with, among um, the government officials and implementers of the um, QRES who have um, some specific knowledge about uh, the implementation details and design um, with the external um, community as well. Um, and so um, you know, again, it's, it's about thinking comprehensively um, and inviting um, stakeholders um, and including the professionals, the teachers and the program directors, um, early care, the pr home providers, um, the school age providers, they need to have a voice in this conversation um, because they are the ones that you know, encounter um, conflicting directives, multiple monitoring visits, um, and when we've got these different um, approaches to expanding quality, working at cross purposes, I think we're kind of short shooting everyone um, in the foot a little bit there. So um, it's a conversation, you know, it, it's, it's I you know, can't emphasize enough how um, when it comes to this one particular component of thinking about QRIS 3.0 um, that the conversation should be um, really inclusive. Um, I also think that with this paper um, we try to highlight that there's some really wonderful opportunities to, be, um, to expand um, the, the pool, uh, you know, as Ann mentioned. Um, it's going to take a lot of uh, inventiveness and creativity to get to the, the system that supports um, the kids who need it the most with exceptionally qual uh, exceptional services. Um, and so, you know, we want to bring kind of that this initiative and the momentum around pre-K um, funding um, into that conversation and, and see it as an asset. Um, and then I do see that there is a question about you know, how, do, how do we define pre-K, um, state-funded preschool, and we really look at the NEAR, um, National Institute for Early Education Research, state preschool um, yearbook work on that front. Um, and it's a, it's a funding stream typically to support four-year-olds, sometimes three-year-olds, um, in, in the year before they begin kindergarten to really promote their school readiness skills. So it can happen. Um, uh, a pre-K program happens often in community-based settings that provide child care. It works with, it can work depending on the state um, and, the rule, and the parameters around it. It can be located in um, homes and in, in public schools. Um, and uh, it's, it's um, the way we were looking at the, the notion of a pre-K program has to do with that state level funding stream that can be allocated to a number of different places um, depending on the policy design in that locality. Thanks, Kate. Um, well, I'd just like to go to um, a, a question or two that any of the um, presenters today should feel free to weigh in on. And um, one of my questions is, how do we communicate the need for an integrated system that acknowledges and leverages each program's strengths and contribution to early childhood, rather than like deepening this siloed approach where each group is working on its own? And I think that one of the concerns is in tight physical times, everybody tends to pull back and, and hold on um, rather than embrace the collaborative spirit. Do, what would any of you respond to that notion, again, of systems building through what you put forward in your papers or, or what you've been thinking about the system development? Hmm. Well, this is Anne. I think the way that I would approach that question is to say you have to be building coalitions and at all times, and they are easier to build probably when money is not tight or people are not feeling threatened. It's easier to build them in, in good times, um, but you gotta build them. We have to begin to see all of us as part of the early care and education community, whether we call ourselves child care or pre-K or Head Start or whatever you wanna call yourself. Um, that I think is really important. The more we can do that and, and recognize that we're, we're all part of one system. 
I have one other thing to say. Go ahead, Harriet. Okay, so I agree with Anne that um, that basically whatever our positions or roles are in doing the work, that we have to do everything to be unified. But I also was thinking in particular because part of what we've done today is advance the idea that the QRIS itself can be a unifier. At the same time, and I think um, – you can see this as Kate tried to outline the different models she was looking at when she started researching how to QRIS and state pre-K programs fit together, that we have a ways to go there in trying to help that to happen. And we largely, of course, built our QRIS on a child care frame. And we then find sometimes that we actually have different standards and sometimes higher standards for some of the programs that are coming into the QRIS, the pre-K or Head Start program, than the child care program. So I actually would also say in addition to having that spirit of all for one and one for all and doing the important work on that, that if we want the QRIS to really help us be that unifier, then we really need to set forward our redesigns and rethinks as we're forming QIS so that we're getting the programs we're asking to participate actually on equal footing in terms of how we do this work. So I I think that's a, a place that we can challenge ourselves as a broader community to, um, rethink basically from our history as we march into the future. And this is, Ian, if I can just add to what um, Ann and Harry just said. So I do have to recognize that parents don't really care whether it's, I mean, they really don't. They want the best and the high quality. And so that was really the intention for the tool was to really get closer at this cross-sector. So when you look at the tool, um, the, the QRS cross-sector uh, QRS tool, you'll see that the high level of the ones where we're really trying to encourage and really implore systems to really consider where can you bring in together all of the early teen education systems, whether in standards, whether in financing, whether in stakeholder engagement, is that we recognize that the future of early teen education is going to require that cross-sector to happen, especially during the tight times. And so the tool, hopefully, will really help states, localities, and systems to really think really, really thoughtfully about how do you bring everybody together at the table so when there is sort of a lean time that you are already together and you can figure out how do I leverage the expertise of, you know, whether it's Head Start in this arena, whether it's child care, whether it's pre-K, how do I leverage those expertise that each of those programs bring to really make a stronger system? And the tool is really trying to get at that. And so when you look at the high level, that's where we're really trying to encourage that. That's great. I have one final question, and then I'll ask you each to share just a closing thought. How, how do we not create in this vision of QRIS systems or tracks that compound inequities? Like what kind of reflections or challenges would you put forward to us to address the inequity? Some of the questions that Ioma was bringing up for us in the cross-sector tool. Does anybody have a comment or something for us to think about um, in, in that light? So this was Ioma, um in regards to your question. So I, I guess when I think about how do we really try to address, I think I think we all believe that we all have the same definition for equity, right? But I think if you remember that imagery that I showed, that right, we can, you know, a lot of us are doing equity work, and I think that's that's a great place to be. Eventually, I think we want to be in a space of where we don't actually have to have to address the inequities any longer, right, that we now are in a system where people can can access it without without the need for all these various supports, right, where we have to create these various supports to individuals, but that eventually the system, is, it, it provides the wealth of opportunities for every single person. That, to me, is eventually is the ideal of what we want, where there is no need for, for, for support to, to equalize, you know, 
the inequities that exist in the system. And so I'm hoping that, the, at least from my viewpoint on the tool part, is that eventually that the equity issue becomes part of every single thing that we do, right? So that if we think about equity in its broadest of forms, right, whether it's around the racial culture issue or whether it's around those who live in particular communities, whether rural, urban, disadvantaged, et cetera, that eventually that becomes part of how we do everything that we do, that we never do our work without considering how is it needed the needs of every single person wherever we where, wherever we are at, right? That becomes this part of discourse, the way that we do work, the way that we think about financing, whether we think about governance, all of that, the equity becomes just a way that we breathe and it's not something that's not an add on to the work that we do. I love what you're saying, Yo. Data, right? Look at your data, consider the equity issues and, and what are the structural, institutional and personal um, things that are keeping you away from make creating an equitable system. And we have an opportunity in our creation um, to, to break down some of those barriers. Anne, did you want to add something in? Yeah, because I was, I was saying two things. Um, I completely agree with you, Homa, and we, ought to, we need to have measures of QRIS success that are related to mm -hmm. improving equity. So that equity, mm -hmm. we have ways, we have benchmarks that we set for ourselves, and and we're serious about them, and we report on them, and that's part of how we judge the success of our QRIS. And well, I think this you. is Kate kind of jumping in, saying that when it comes to this, really looking at the pre-K within the system. Um, it's, this is where I think it becomes really important to think critically about whether the way the status quo has the potential to compound um, the challenges. And, um, you know, just to emphasize that when we're talking about equity, it's for, um, in terms of our children, um, having access to, the, to really great services and opportunities, but it's also a big workforce issue. Um, and in my work, that's kind of where um, kind of that kind of kept bubbling up and thinking, of, looking at what states were doing with respect to teachers and compensation, and um, whether you know how we can use the QRES and use just this conversation to um, get our supports for early educators in line with the expectations, um, and when they are out of whack. Um, which I think can happen sometimes when you um, do this, this pre-K integration, um, it's, it, it can set us back. So um, and plug for see that some teachers and support. Chat has, has brought forward consider developing an equity policy lens that provides questions related to equity so that it, it is a conversation that's present in what you're, in what you're doing. Well, I'd just like to, um, the time is getting short. Um, there will be a number of sessions related to these tools, um, or will the tools will be featured at the Expanding Reach, Enhancing Impact, Advancing Equity, QRIS NLN conference uh, in Dallas, Texas this summer. And so we look to engaging more. Um, thank you so much for uh, being with us today. Would any of the speakers, how about if we just go, Kate, a final word? Um, I think that, um, I, I'll just say thank you. Thank you. It's uh, 429, and I'm happy to be part of the conversation and look forward to the conversation continuing. Anne? Um, I, I agree. Thank you. And and be open to all the possibilities. Be open to all the possibilities. Uh, don't overlook any potential funding stream. <laughs> Harriet? Yes. Um, yeah, my thanks to everyone as well. I think my last thing is just for everyone to remember that we're actually pretty early still in the development of QRIS and that Part of the point of all these tools is to ask us to take the pause moment to sit back and really think about like what we're doing and where we're heading in an intentional way and to feel okay that we keep inventing, reinventing um, the work that we're doing.
but that the kinds of big picture issues we've been talking about today, they're pretty important and that we really want to encourage people, even though we know how busy everyone is day to day, to really take advantage and to step out, think about the financing, think about the overall frame, think about the policy communications work, you know, and think about the field as a whole. Um, so that's my kind of closing comments for the day. Thank you. And Ioma, last but not least. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. And I hope you to get your feedback on the tool that we have. Thank you. Thank you, Ioma. Well, thanks to all our presenters and to all of our participants in the conversation today. And look forward to hearing from you um, about your use of the tools and what you're finding in your state. Goodbye, everyone.